Wednesday, January 11th, 2012, at 10.30 a.m., a meeting of the Committee on Administration of the Chicago Park District is being held in the 8th floor boardroom at the Administration Building, located at 541 North Fairbanks. Will the Secretary please take a roll call? Vice Chair Commissioner Lavelle? Here. President Traubert? Here. Commissioner Hanlon? Here. Commissioner Koldike? Quorum is present. Let the record reflect that Commissioner Shallaby, Commissioner Salgado, General Superintendent Michael Kelly, and General Counsel Maria Garcia are also in attendance. The meeting will please come to order. At this time, we will consider item number one from the Acting Director of Human Resources, an authorization to enter into a contract for electronic live scan fingerprinting services. Mr. Simpkins, will you please address us? Good morning. President Traubert, Commissioners, General Superintendent and CEO Kelly. My name is Michael Simpkins and I am the Acting Director of Human Resource. I'm here today to recommend that the General Superintendent and CEO or his designee enter into contract with Accurate Biometric for the purpose of providing fingerprinting service for new employees, contractors, and volunteers. The contractor was selected pursuant to a publicly advertised request for proposal. No work may commence and no payment shall be made to vendor prior to the execution of a written agreement. The Chicago Park District requires the services of a firm to provide fingerprinting services for new employees, contractors, and volunteers. The awardee shall provide staff, equipment, and services necessary to perform electronic live scans fingerprinting service for the Chicago Park District. The awardee's equipment will capture fingerprints digitally on a computer and electronically forward the prints to the Illinois State Police, FBI, or other agencies at the request of the Chicago Park District for criminal background checks. Are there any questions at this time? Who is our current vendor? Uh, Accurate Biometric is actually our current vendor at this time. And is the cost uh, for each scan or each fingerprint check roughly the same as what it was? Yes, we've actually uh, uh, been using Accurate for the last six years and throughout uh, the last six years and including this negotiation, the cost of the fingerprints have remained the same. Thank you. And are there alternatives to, to this? Can you, would the, uh, you know, the state police or any other agency provide this service? Well, actually, uh, the, the prints go through the state police. Uh, FBI have a, a separate uh, cost of, to get their results, but it still has to run through the state police, and this is all uh, incorporated with this contract as well. So we do have the ability to get um, uh, an FBI uh, uh, fingerprint results on any uh, employee or volunteer or contractor. So this takes them through a, nation, a national database? The accurate uh, the state fingerprint, it will only uh, encompass the state of Illinois. If we feel a need that we need to get a national search, we can, uh, through this contract, uh, have it, uh, the prints sent through the FBI, and then we will get a national uh, search and results on that individual. Okay, and th so this, this, and this may be a question more about policy than about this specific contract. But the pedophile who moves from Indiana to Illinois who gets his fingerprints and we just check the Illinois database, is, are we going to miss that? Uh, if we don't do the FBI, we're looking at um, uh, possibly uh, including um, last known residents for maybe the last three or four years to try to identify if someone lived in another state so that would be a red flag to also um, uh, reach out to try to, uh, to do the FBI search. I don't know. It's, I guess, uh, just from my own perspective, um, uh, is there two parts to this? Is there an additional cost for running it through the FBI database? Yes, it is. Uh, the, t the cost, if we ran it through the FBI, will be $47.25 as opposed to the state is $26.50. Is that an additional $47? Well, that's what the total cost so would that's be. That's the total cost. Yes. I don't know, maybe uh, from a policy standpoint, at, at least for the people who are uh, working in contact with children, we may want to cast a, a wider net 
and look at the national database. It just seems to me that it doesn't make sense to look only in Illinois for people who could be putting us in risk. Yeah, and with this uh, proposal uh, to, to go into enter into contract with them, we've uh, added a, a dollar amount, which we feel is sufficient enough if we intended on doing uh, the FBI uh, uh, background check as well, that we will be covered with based on the number of uh, individuals we normally uh, fingerprint within a year's time. So it seems it does seem like two different issues. On the one hand, we want we need to get these fingerprints, whether we're going to do it at the state or the FBI level. Uh, and you're saying that the, this is the cheapest, most effective way to get these fingerprints. And then from a policy point of view, Mike, I think you know we're asking that, that you at least review the policy as to then what you do with these fingerprints. No, yes, exactly. So for the point of the board, the issue at hand, we, we obviously need the system to continue to review our employees as we move forward. It's actually critical. Uh, from a second standpoint, I actually have a meeting Friday with uh, our general counsel and our chief program officer to evaluate where we are and where we're going forward as far as uh, background checks and overall just protecting our uh, our clients who are often uh, minors. And, and uh, uh, this contract calls for new employees, contracts, and volunteers. Uh, do, do we do any kind of check, uh, again, from a policy standpoint on, say, somebody who's been with, the, you know, 10 years with the, with the, uh, the park district? Do we, do we ever do a spot check maybe on... Uh, Occasional, just to again ensure uh, I well, well, safety. What happens is once they're fingerprinted, uh, they get a as an ISP code through the Illinois State Police, and at any time, if something, if they should uh, commit a crime or be arrested, accurate biometric. Uh, the Illinois State Police will inform them. Ignored they, in turn, it. inform us. We just had a, a case uh, last week where we had someone that volunteered for us a few years ago who was not currently volunteering with us, and he had an update to his criminal record, and we were made aware of that. So once they're in this system, any changes to their uh, record is updated, and we are made aware of that. It's a priority for me, child protection. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth with the state of Illinois and us over the years about the boundaries on pedophiles and, and the different laws, and I think a lot of it's still tied up in the courts. Um, so we, I, we're going to evaluate it very strongly. Uh, just to close the door on this discussion, the, the, the volunteers, that's where it gets really tricky. Um, I think we found a, a very good common ground on what a, vol a volunteer group that wants to clean a park and will have no contact with children. Because quite frankly, a lot of volunteers, they want to volunteer their time, and they do not want to be background checked for, a lot of them for just a constitutional argument. So yeah. we've got to be cognizant of that as well. Yeah, I think it really, for me, the line is people who interface with children. There are a lot of people who are willing to do a lot of other things in the parks, and right. those people don't require that level of scrutiny. Right. How long have we been background checking people? As long as I've been here. Yes, it's... How do you, so it's a state it's state law, and I mean we've been doing it for the nine years I've been here. I believe we started doing the background uh, check in like 1999, if I'm um, correct. No, we did have a, we we had a case, a, a terrible case, a pedophile case, uh, a few years back, and it uh, it happened in 97, 98, 98. And it was a volunteer coming out, well, it was someone coming out of a completely private organization. And um, it, it's, it, it was a, sounded a bell for me on, on how we need to protect our clients as best we can. And, uh, you know, I guess the question is, and it, I, I do not expect you to do anything going backwards. You know, I, I think that that's not really as uh, feasible. But if the background checking started in 99, people who were on the payroll prior to that, we don't know really if they have anything in their background. So I'm glad that we're at least putting this screen in place going forward, but we do clearly need to make some distinction since people are so mobile. We need to have a closer look. And we, and we during the application process, we do get quite a few uh, applicants 
who go through the process and at the end of the day we do not hire because of the background checks yes. quite a few actually yes quite a few any further questions I commissioners we do have a speaker that signed up to discuss this matter mr george blakemore uh, okay mr blakemore may i please remind mr blakemore that you have two minutes to make your comments I'm aware of that. thank you My name is George Blakemore, and I am a public servant. Public servant means that I have no financial interest in one way or the other dealing with this government agency and this particular contract. It's interesting. I have many, many questions. Perhaps the young lady will say, Mr. Blakemore, your two minutes are up or your three minutes or whatever is up. But I, I beg you to please tolerate and listen. The first issue is that we have a city government that and a state government that can hook up with the FBI on a national level. Fingerprinting. You can be a fingerprinted by the city of Chicago and they can hook up with the FBI on a national level of the 50 states. Also, the state can do this. I think that you should, should be cognizant to use our public dollars in a prudent way to use contract with the state agency or the city. I'm very, uh, I have issues in, in connecting one agency to another. But in this particular circumstance, I think there's no need for outside vendor. And looking here at this vendor, uh, uh, a majority interest, white lady with her husband and all other white people own this as as. Uh, uh, as a member of, of that cooperation, that, that firm, you know, we want it to be clear that it is a minority Please make firm. your closing remarks, and, Mr. And Blakemore. Mr. Blakemore wants this to be clear. And when I asked the gentleman, he said, this is certified by the city. I wanted to know, is it $1 million, $2 million, or $100 million? When a person reaches this point, they no longer can come in as a minority vendor under the Affirmative Action Act. Mr. Blakemore, you're These two minutes are up. These are questions that need to be answered. And I'm wanting to know how can an a, a, a agency, if you all would list the race of the agency or the race of the contractor, that 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 receive these contracts and why would you let a contractor he's coming to you for benefits so why can't he pay for his own fingerprint mr so blakemore your mr blakemore your two minutes are seated. Up, please. he's going to be seated he he's probably the only public speaker that's going to come up uh, in this uh, this mr. morning blakemore, it, please conclude. so i'm going to be seated and i hope that you each one of you try to address these issues that I brought up. And thank you, and thank you, and thank you for making me aware that I went over extended two or three minutes over my time limit. And may God bless all of you. Thank you, Mr. Blackmore. <clears throat> Are there any further comments uh, or questions on the part of the board? I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? We'll do a roll call we'll do a if roll that's call. Okay. okay. Vice Chair Commissioner Lavelle? Yes. President Traubert? Aye. Commissioner Hanlon? Aye. Motion carried and the matter is adopted. Thank you. That concludes the Committee on Administration. Is there a motion to adjourn? So Move. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing no opposed, the committee is now adjourned.
on this day, Wednesday, January 11, 2012, at 1048 a.m., a meeting of the Committee on Programs and Recreation of the Chicago Park District is being held in the 8th floor boardroom of the Administration Building located at 541 North Fairbanks. Will the Secretary please take a roll call? Chair Commissioner Shallaby? Here. Vice Chair Commissioner Hanlon? Here. Commissioner Salgado? Here. President Traubert? Here. Quorum is present. Let the record reflect that Commissioner Lavelle, General Superintendent Michael Kelly, and General Counsel Maria Garcia are also in attendance. This meeting will please come to order. Item number one from the Director of Planning, Construction, and Facilities request to initiate the 45 day notice period to name Park uh, 532 as Hattie K. Williams Park. Rob Raymond will address the Commission. Good morning, Commissioners. Rob Raymond, Director of Planning, Construction, and Facilities. Uh, it's recommended that an order be entered authorizing the general superintendent or his designee to initiate a 45-day notice period to solicit public input to name Park 532, located at 4101 South Lake Park Avenue, as Hattie K. Williams Park. This is a 2.85-acre park in the 4th Ward, Oakland community. In 2006, the Park District acquired this park from the Chicago Housing Authority. The park was created as part of the CHA's plan for transformation, which included demolishing the deteriorated public housing units, known as Lake Park Homes, and replacing them with a mixed income community. The park includes a playground, passive landscape areas, and a bronze sculpture entitled Restoration that symbolically represents the transformation of the Oakland neighborhood. The Southside community members have requested that the park district name Park 532 in honor of Hattie K. Williams. Hattie Williams was a Chicago social worker and a civil rights activist who devoted her life to improving conditions and encouraging equitable treatment in the city's minorities and, and of city minorities, women and girls, and underprivileged citizens. She spurred reforms within the Chicago public schools and helped establish Head Start, services for teen mothers, and programs to address gang violence and domestic violence. She received many national awards and an honorary PhD. Williams advocated for the creation of Park 532 and lived within a few blocks of its site for over 40 years. It's my pleasure to recommend initiation of the naming process for this park, and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions to Rob? Is there support from uh, Alderman Burns? Yes. Yeah. If there are no other questions, we'll entertain a motion to accept. So moved. Second. Will the secretary take a roll call of the adoption of this matter? Chair Commissioner Shallaby? Aye. Vice Chair Commissioner Hanlon? Aye. Commissioner Salgado? Aye. President Traubert? Aye. Motion carried and the matter is adopted. Item number two from the Director of Planning, Construction, and Facilities request to name Park 554 as Julia de Burgos Park. Again, Rob Raymond. Please. Thank you. It's recommended that an order be entered authorizing the general superintendent or as a designee to officially name Park 554 as Julia de Burgos Park. Pursuant to the code of the Chicago Park District, this request to name Park 554 was forwarded to the secretary of the Chicago Park District who filed a copy of this request with the Committee on Programs and Recreation and initiated a notice period to solicit public input. Notices were posted in the parks and sent to advisory councils located within a one mile radius of the park site. Elected officials were also notified of the proposal, including the aldermen of the ward in which the park is located. The notice of a 45 day, days uh, soliciting public input regarding the naming proposal was initiated on November 15, 2011. Numerous community members and organizations have provided strong support for the proposed naming, including the Logan Square Neighborhood Association, Friends of the Bloomingdale Trail, the Block Club Federation, Vita Bella Ensemble, Rumble Arts, Youth Service Project, the Puerto Rican Arts Alliance, 26 Ward, and 26 Ward Alderman Robert Maldonado. This 0.21 acre park site is located at 1805 North Albany, directly adjacent to the Bloomingdale Trail, and will serve as a major point of access for the residents of the Humboldt and Logan Square neighborhoods. This is a aerial of the property prior to construction and a concept plan. The Logan Square Open Place plan was completed in 2004 after collaborations with the City of Chicago and input from more than 400 community members. 
and identified major opportunities for open space within Logan Square, including the Bloomingdale Trail and development of this park. The plan included this small but strate strategically located park, which includes innovative play structures, soft surfacing, pathways, lighting, ornamental fencing, drinking fountain, artwork benches, and native landscaping. The future connection to the Bloomingdale Trail will be planned and construction constructed in a partnership with the City of Chicago and Trust for Public Land. A uh, photo of the completed park. Uh, born in Puerto Rico, Julio de Burgos is considered one of the greatest poets in Latin America. A feminist activist who lived during a time when women were expected to fill traditional role, roles, de Burgos wrote poems that wove themes of intimacy, the land, and st social struggle of the oppressed. She lived in New York for more than a decade. Although she died at the young age of 39, she published three books of poetry that have received international recognition. Today, there are schools and parks in both the East Coast and in Puerto Rico that honor her name and spirit. Park 554 is a fitting location for Chicago to also honor her life and achievements. And I'm happy to answer any questions. We addressed this park a couple of meetings ago, I think, as far as development. The one thing that always stands out is that big white wall over there. It's such a attractant for a, a, a graffiti. Or, or work, are we mm. possibly working with the community groups to get some art artwork up there? Or? Yeah, actually, um, we remember your comment from from the last board meeting, and the project manager has reached out to Friends of Bloomingdale Trail, oh, good. who's been in contact with the, the community groups and uh, public art group. Okay. So they're already working through some ideas that may be inspired by the writings of Julia de Burgos. Right. Uh, that might be more than just a, a a, a mural may have more relief or sculptural elements that would tie in with the future transition from the park mm -hmm. to the Bloomingdale Trail. So it's a great opportunity yeah, and um, uh, people are already thinking about it. And Rob, confirm for the board that uh, the Bloomingdale Trail Advisory Council, which is numerous, uh, mm -hmm. is in support of this naming. Yes, they are. <coughs> Rob, in the 45-day period, <laughs> did you hear any uh, anything against this naming? No, not to my knowledge. So everyone seems to be behind. Mm -hmm. I move. I move to approve the item. Second. If no objection, we'll apply the last favorable roll call vote from the prior matter to this matter. Motion carried, and the matter is adopted. Item number three from Rob Raymond, uh, Raymond Director of Planning, Construction, and Facilities, request to name Thomas Wortham the fourth playground in Nat King Cole. Rob. Thank you. It's recommended that an order be entered authorizing the general superintendent or his designee to officially name Thomas Wortham the fourth playground in Nat Cole Park. The notice period of 45 days soliciting public input regarding the naming proposal was initiated on November 22, 2011. Numerous community members and organizers have provided strong support for the proposed naming, including 6th Ward Alderman Roderick Sawyer. This is a 4.69 acre park in the 6th Ward, Chatham community. This is an aerial of the site, again prior to construction, showing the location of the playground. And once again, another great example of a fully accessible playground with unique play structures, spray feature, artwork, and other uh, landscape amenities. A photo of the site. So May of 2011 marked the one year anniversary of the tragic death of Thomas Wortham a Chicago police officer who made great contributions to the park and surrounding community, and whose murder has inspired many to stand up against violence in our city. Area residents and the Nat King Cole Park Advisory Council have requested that the playground be named in his honor. Born and raised in Chicago, Thomas Eugene Wortham IV was a U.S. Army First Lieutenant and Chicago police officer who had strong commitment to serve the people in our city. While Thomas received a Bachelor of Arts in Communication from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, he served his community by joining the Wisconsin National Guard in 1999. He served in the Iraq War in the 1st, uh, 125th Infantry, Infantry Battalion and the 105th CAV and rose to the rank of First Lieutenant in 2008, receiving many co commendations, including the Bronze Star. Thomas remained in the National Guard, fulfilling a lifelong dream of serving in the military. Thomas's service to his community continued when he became a police officer, first in Evergreen Park and then as a member of the Chicago Police Department. Other, or I'm sorry, Officer Wortham served for nearly three years in the city's Englewood Police D District. Wortham lived near Nat K King Cole Park and generously gave of his free time by serving as president of the Park Advisory Council since 2008. 
His accomplishments included spearheading the development of the new playground in the park. Officer Wortham was especially devoted to making the community safer for its residents. Uh, this is poignant in considering that during off-duty hours of June 2010, Wortham was murdered in the neighborhood during an attempted robbery. Because of Wortham's association with Cole Park Playground, it's fitting that the feature, feature be named in his honor. I can take any questions. Okay. Come on up, Irma. I was just going to thank you. So as far as I'm concerned, why don't you? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Rob. Good morning, Commissioners. Irma Tranter, President of Friends of the Parks, Superintendent Kelly, um, President Traubert. Uh, we are here to thank you for your uh, outstanding work on this playground and um, the whole planning process to move this ahead uh, in a very rapid and a very detailed uh, in, uh, process that involved the community from step one. Um, uh, we knew when worked with, as did the Park District, Thomas Wortham, uh, a 30-year-old who gave so much to his community. It was very rare to find a 30-year-old, you know, giving that much time back to a neighborhood, but he did. In all ways, uh, we were all deeply, deeply in pain uh, with his tragic death. Uh, Friends of the Parks was, um, you know, after the year passed, met with his, you know, met with his family to make sure that this was something they wanted to do, and they definitely felt that a playground was a tribute to their son who was working to improve the playground. Um, and I think 45 days ago, Mr. Wortham was here speaking to that. Uh, but again, uh, the Park District really came on board on this, provided a lot of money, a million dollars for more than just the playground. It's always great working with Rob Raymond and Michael Lang was the project person there uh, who followed through um, the work day, you know, rearranging things to ensure that the community did have a hand in building this playground. There were about 60 people here building, putting, you know, screwing on things and uh, laying the sod, uh, and I think that that helped with the part, if you can ever heal from something like that, that kind of a community build is just a small step in maybe helping the community to do some healing, um, as I say, if you can ever get over that kind of a thing. Um, but there's such a buy-in on this playground. It's loved already, uh, and the, the Park District really uh, uh, needs to be commended on uh, on this kind of uh, really tribute to someone who gave so much to the city and to the country. So we're thanking you for uh, everything you've done on this. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Irma. Irma, thank, uh, thank you for the words. And again, thank you for your efforts and the efforts of, friend of Friends of the Park uh, and Board. Thank you in advance for your vote on this. This is... Uh, this one shook the Park District team up a little bit more than some of the others because so many people here knew Thomas Wortham personally and uh, is someone who was out there hours after it happened and saw it I don't know if that ever goes away it's, it's still pretty raw but it's one of those examples that you, you can't bring them back but if by naming that 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 section of the park and, and by making this improvement the community wakes up and they take that park back and and, and the thugs down there know that they're not welcome there it, that's for the community then you know and I guess he didn't die in vain. So uh, again, thank you to Friends of the Park. Thank you to the board um, for, I presume, your favorable vote on this renaming. Mike, will we have a, uh, an official unveiling maybe and the weather a little nicer? Or I, I, does the family want that? Do they want, do they want a memorial? They sort of already or? had one. Had one. Um, I, 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 you know, there may be future events tied to that park. Uh, stay tuned. I want to give the Wortham family an opportunity to let us know what they want to do next or if they want to just sort of put some distance in time. Uh, I'll let you know. I move to uh, approve the item. Second. If no objection, we'll apply the last favorable roll call vote from the prior matter to this matter. Motion carried and the matter is adopted. This concludes the Committee on Programs and Recreation. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The Committee on Programs and Recreation is now adjourned. On this day, January 11th, 12th, 2012, at 
1102, a meeting of the Committee on Capital Improvements of Chicago Park District is being held on the 8th floor boardroom of the Administration Building located at 551 North Fairbanks. Will the Secretary please take a roll call? Chair Commissioner Coldike. Vice Chair Commissioner Salgado. Here. Commissioner Shallaby. Here. Commissioner Lavelle. Here. President Traubert. Here. Quorum is present. Let the record reflect that Commissioner Hamlin, General Superintendent Michael Kelly, and General Counsel Maria Garcia are also in attendance. This meeting will please come to order. Uh, item number one from the Director of Planning, Construction, and Facilities Authority to accept the transfer of property located at 2754 to 2860 South Illinois Street for New Park, Park number 571. Rob Raymond. Thank you. It is recommended that the Board of Commissioners of the Chicago Park District adopt an ordinance authorizing the acceptance of property from the City of Chicago, commonly referred to as 2754 South Eleanor Street. It is further recommended that the Board authorize the General Superintendent or his designee to negotiate and enter into and execute such agreements, amendments, and indemnities, and instruments, and perform any and all acts as may be necessary and advisable in connection with the transaction. The city owns this 4.1 acre property and intends to transfer it to the park district for the development of Park 571 to address the needs of the Bridgeport community area and the 11th Ward. To provide context, this is one of the four boathouse sites in the Mayor's River Initiative, which includes improved water quality, greater access to the river as a recreational opportunity, connectivity between park spaces and neighborhoods, and this notion of connectivity is very similar to what will be accomplished in the Blooming Child Trail Initiative, also announced by the mayor. It was formerly owned, the site was formerly owned by People's Gas, and it has since been remediated with a 10 to 20 foot dig and a, a residential standard cap. Um, mostly the dig was down to native clays. Uh, the requests of the community and at the support of the aldermen, the site is to be developed into a river edge park consisting of a competition grade rowing center and boathouse with fishing access, river walk, passive park land, fencing, site furnishings, and lighting. Studio Gang is currently working on plans for the building and the site with input from us and the Chicago Training Center, a non-for-profit competitive rowing group that strives to get kids from underserved neighborhoods into boats and onto the water. There'll be st storage for 30 to 40 competition sweep boats, canoes, kayaks, gear, and safety equipment. Also an office, community room, viewing deck, indoor training and workout room, vending equipment, outdoor and outdoor dining areas. Funding for the boathouses comes from a public-private partnership in a $16 million funding uh, fundraising campaign that, we're, that actually GFMR staff is working on with the mayor's office currently. And as always, we'd like to put these acquisitions into a, a little bit of context. So briefly, I'll touch on a, a pretty exciting story that we have to tell. Um, from over the last 10 years, we've acquired 892 new acres. That encompasses 52 new parks and 85 park extent, ex expansions. Our current total acreage is 8,127 8 acres. The 2011 um, acquisitions alone include these parks, again, spread throughout the city, which is about 550 acres. We have, for 2012, pending acquisitions of approximately 300 acres. That's 23 new parks and 27 park expansions. So the it's been a great past 10 years, and uh, it seems to be moving in the same direction at um, an increasing speed. And that was just a quick note, again, on placing um, these kinds of acquisitions and these kinds of initiatives in our overall progress over the last 10 years. Question, if mm -hmm. I might. How do we compare per capita uh, with acreage uh, for other cities our size? Uh, we do pretty well, but we're not in the top tier currently. If we could break the 10,000 acre mark, we'd be in a sort of New York, um, you know, like LA kind of uh, category. Um, but when we're striving toward that, but I think in terms of acquiring land, we're as aggressive as anyone. Uh, and Rob, uh, along those lines, um, you know, that statistic, that per capita st statistic is, is more revealing when you break it down by region and neighborhood. That's true. And we all know, and this much has been made of it, and it should be, that there are areas of the city that uh, are so-called underparked. Mm -hmm. And while, I mean, this is a great record, 
um, and in getting these parks, um, we have to be opportunistic. Um, your planning department, though, hopefully there's also, as much as can be, an identification of these neighborhoods mm -hmm. that are underparked and trying to be strategic and opportunities in those. So as long as you brought this up, I wonder if you could address that. Sure. Um, we have lots of, wow, <coughs> gads of maps, actually, that sort of talk about um, open space per capita, where we have underserved areas, where we're park poor. Logan Square happens to be like one of the ones that's on the top of the list. And we work with city, the city planning department to analyze <coughs> these kind of things and look for opportunities in these acquisitions. Of course, we're always targeting, focusing on the areas that are park poor. But again, you know, the, the decisions are made by many of the, the plans that have already been put in place, like this um, uh, city space plan and other open space plans by DPD. And then what happens is it comes by opportunity. So of course, if there's opportunity um, and we're getting land for free, we take it where we can, um, even if it's not in a park poor neighborhood, but we push for, and the city of Chicago helps us push for land in those park poor neighborhoods. Yeah, and goes without saying that the charge of this board is for you to really push to acquire land in those yeah. park poor areas. And Looking at the distribution map, which, I, which was a nice slide to show, you can see that those acquisitions are really spread. Um, there is definite thought behind where we're, where we're trying to uh, expand the district. Just on that, that the point, I know there's been great work done with local community groups on the Celotex site, um, but uh, to what degree in those park poor areas are we working with local organizations, churches, entities to make sure that there's a heavy involvement to, to maybe surface opportunities? Mm -hmm. um, where we have current advisory councils are in our current parks. So the community groups that we work with in park poor areas where there is no park are people like the groups associated with the Celotex property. And yeah, we welcome those partnerships. Again, we work with the city and the aldermen and, the, and, um, and reaching out to these communities to try to fi find properties that are uh, suitable for us and then work with them to gain support in working with elected officials to find the money and, uh, and the willpower to bring those into fruition. So Great. Thank you. It's, a, it's, an art, it's a, a tool in our tool belt to get these projects done in the community. Great. Thank Rob, you. back to this specific acquisition then. I've mm -hmm. been out there and it, it, this is really, it is an exciting acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the environmental remediation. Mm -hmm. um, so in accepting this, is there, do, do we have any potential liability for anything there? And if we do, how are we handling that? I think on this site, we don't have the typical NFR, but we have a comfort letter from... Um, Tell, uh, explain to the board briefly oh, what sorry. NFR means. Uh, NFR is a no further remediation letter that we get from the state of Illinois, uh, EPA, basically that says you've done everything you can. Uh, we do not intend to pursue any environmental action in any case because of all the evidence and of, of cleanup and what we have on record. So it's really, that's the, sort of like the ironclad document you like to have in your, your back pocket when you accept a, prop, a property. In other cases, you can get things like comfort letters that are just a, you know, another place in that level of comfort <laughs> in terms of environmental, um, uh, yeah, environmental conditions of the site. And again, we have uh, really good staff who focus specifically on, and Dan Cooper for, would be the, the person who focuses specifically on environmental for all of these park acquisitions or park development projects. And he used to, you know, he came from the private sector and has done a lot of work with the state, knows the state people, and it's, he's a great resource for us to make sure that what we're doing is not putting ourselves in a position of, of li environmental liability. Is, what's the reason why we don't have the NFR level is just a timing thing or it's I'll have to look into that for you I'm not exactly sure what that what what's behind that it may be timing but I'll, I'll find out and let you know before this afternoon it, it, there's also things called uh, letters of comfort um, which sort of sounds funny when you get into environmental liability <laughs> but uh, um, two two recent examples of a comfort letter is uh, Celotex and um, Stearns Quarry I believe did not come with an NFR either I think, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure, but I think you're right. right. So does that say uh, on behalf of the EPA that they are not likely to pursue further remediation activity? I mean, the, the, the NFR or the no further remediation required letter uh, says I flatly, they're flatly not going to require anything else, but this 
doesn't seem to give you that level of comfort. Rob can clarify, but my, my understanding of the system would be if you're not getting an NFR letter now, you're not going to get one, and you've reached some other settlement on what you're going to get as far as environmental liability. To understand, and I'm cutting off at any point, the, 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 the thumbnail on environmental liability is when you take ownership of property, yes, you, you, are, you are taking. However, you're still only responsible for what you cause. So when you reach agreed amount, uh, agreed upon status of the property with a accepted EPA standard of how you're going to cap that contamination, so long as the park district follows those guidelines, we have no liability. It's all on the previous owner which you have to look at in it when you, before you take these. In this case, people's gas, uh, we're all from a business standpoint, they're not going anywhere. So, um, but however, when Rob said that they've cleaned this to native clay, the site's clean. It was very dirty, you know, it's, it's, it's very clean. So um, that's another factor that goes into making that decision whether we should take on this liability or not on the property. And just to follow up, I think the city spent like $1.2 million on acquisition and cleanup with uh, people's gas. And Tim just pointed out to me that the city of Chicago also put, their, put themselves in chain of title. So that the city of Chicago and their legal department was as interested in these, these kinds of questions in the transfer of property to us. So I think there's, a, again, a second level of check related to that property transfer. Also, commissioners, many times the difference between a comfort letter and a letter remediation has more to do with the purpose for which you're going to use the property. Um, a letter of uh, no further remediation usually means that you can go ahead and you can excavate further down um, if you need it. So if you're going to build a big high rise and so you'd have to put in pylons or something. A letter of comfort in this case means that you put a cement cap on it and so you don't intend to go down any further and then possibly excavate any contaminants which is the other reason that everybody is probably comfortable with this because you're saying this is it, I'm capping it, no more excavating below it. I have a question, Rob. Can mm -hmm. you take us through the process quickly once an acquisition is made? Very pleased to see that we're continuously acquiring property, but does our budget uh, call for maintenance? Do we have enough in there to cover the new acquisitions? And as a practical matter, what happens once we acquire the property as far as maintenance mm -hmm. and costs? That's a really good question. It's kind of a global question. It's, it's hard to answer in a short um, thing. We're, we're building new parks all the time, and with every new park comes an operational impact. And Mike is, I can see Mike's ready to talk about this already. No, I'm not <laughs> the new one. I feel like this. <laughs> but um, it's one of those things where, as we're acquiring acres, it, we, we just have to be cognizant of the fact that we have, we're going to have more to maintain. Let me, let, me, let me just briefly, when, when you talk about land acquisition, uh, a lot of it, the factor is sometimes you have an opportunity, whether it be dollars or a quick sale or whatever, and you have to balance that. Can we maintain it? Do we have the money to develop it? But boy, if we if, if we don't acquire it now, we may never get another shot at it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, this one's a little bit different. This this one was, uh, I mean, this is as important to the mayor as any, uh, I, I mean, if he's on his short list of capital uh, priorities, this is one of them, uh, the river. Uh, so this this thing got expedited very quickly, uh, and it's it, it's very good for us um, from a park district standpoint. Uh, I'm confident that we'll find the money to maintain it. Just a, a separate question: um, What is there any expected timeline? I didn't see that here. You still have money to raise, right? Quickly. Yeah. Quickly is the expected time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think right. The mayor's Expedite. office is expecting this to move forward quickly. So we're in design now. We'd like to, to uh, move toward bidding this project in the spring. It would be an incredibly aggressive schedule to think we could do anything other than break ground this year. But if we could have a spring opening of the following year, that would be of 2013. That would be a, an accomplishment. Spring of 2013. Yeah. Great. With, with construction prog progress this year. Right. Any further questions? Move to accept. Second. Okay. Um, will Secretary take a roll call? Vice Chair Commissioner Salgado? Aye. Commissioner Shalaby? Aye. Commissioner Lavelle? Aye. President Traubert? Aye. Motion carried and the matter is adopted. Item number two from the 
Director of Planning, Construction, and Facilities Authority to enter into contracts for design and engineering services. Rob? Uh, thank you. Uh, again, this is one of those tools that help us get projects done. Um, it's recommended that an order be entered authorizing the interim, I'm sorry, the general superintendent or his designee, typo, <laughs> to enter into an individual contracts with 111 pre-qualified firms for inclusion in the design and engineering uh, services pre-qualified pool. The pre-qualified firms were selected pursuant to a publicly advertised request for quali qualifications. No minimum amount of work is required or guaranteed to the firms in the pre-qualified pool. Finally, no work may commence and no payment will be made to the contractors prior to the written um, or execution of a written agreement. Again, there are 111 companies as listed on Exhibit A in your packets. It's a term agreement with one year from the date of execution with three additional one-year extension options. Funding will be based on annual appropriations, project-based, and the project capped is 200,000 per category per project. Uh, the design and engin engineering services district-wide in four categories of service are architecture, civil and structural engineering, landscape architecture, and environmental engineering. Uh, the overall M and WB participation are, as always, 25 and 5 uh, for contracts. And this contract was advertised as an RFQ. There are four categories, <coughs> and 125 qualifications were received on the qualifications due date. A total of 111 firms were found by the evaluation committee to be qualified to become part of the design and engineering services pool. All firms have committed to the M and WB requirements. Um, and I can take any questions. Robin, in what uh, situations do you utilize the extension options? Would you re redo this a year from now, or no? It, um, Typically, as we did with the last uh, contract that was sim very similar in nature to this one, we executed each of the um, extension terms prior to going back out to the community for a d another RFQ. I, I will say, though, my vision, and it, it's not going to happen overnight, but my vision is that once a year, companies are given an opportunity to be pre-qualified um, and that the managers are reviewing the companies to see if any of them need to be disqualified. Uh, I'm less concerned about thinning the group, and I am more concerned about constantly giving firms the opportunity to be qualified. Remember, the opportunity to qualify is just that. It's an opportunity right. to receive business. It, they, they don't. There's no guarantees they'll get the work, but to get in that qualified pool, I would like to, I, I've been challenging the staff to uh, try to once a year open those pools up rather than op qualify and then walk away for several years. And, and how often I, how often have we been doing this in the past? Uh, we have probably been working with these pre-qualified pools now for six, seven years. Yeah, at least, I think. And they've grown dramatically in the past uh, three years. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with such a large pool, um, how do they select um, one to do a job? Is it by bid or...? Typically, selection. we'll look at the nature of a job. Let's say 20th and Eleanor, for example, would have a facility as well as park and shoreline treatments. We can go in and take a look at people who have done similar work um, and start with that list. Then we issue a, no a request for proposal to a likely firm based upon that experience. Again, if they have a, a good price uh, that's very competitive and they understand the scope clearly, we have the option to go with them or move to the next firm. Um, on a list uh, that would then be able to provide a proposal. In other words, unlike just about everything else you'll hear from government as far as low bids and, and all that, when it comes to, the des to design work, the state of Illinois changed the law uh, maybe six years back to where you have to select your designer and receive a bid and then go from there. Uh, it, it usually does not go out to to, to everyone. It's, it's it's it, it state changed it about six years ago, so that's essentially in, in price cannot be the be all end all factor on who you select. So if you have a group of designers, who will select the one, and what about all the others? Uh, how I mean, as far as them not being considered to be part of the, the job? I would take recommendation, recommendations from staff for our past experience with firms, and of course, you know, we're always looking to keep working with new firms. 
who've done good work elsewhere but haven't worked with us before. So again, it's, it's right. like other like professional services, whether legal or financial, there's some discretion involved. But how do we assure that there don't become favorites in the pool? It's a large pool. You can't be familiar mm -hmm. with everybody in the pool. Uh, getting pre-qualified is a great thing, but if it doesn't ever get you any work, then that was a lot of effort to go through. Yeah. How do you ensure that there is some distribution of it? It's uh, part of staff responsibility, really. Um, the, the responsibility falls on my staff and then me, and then reporting up to um, the CEO and the COO regarding use of the pool. But do we do ev do we ever look back and uh, do some analysis of the distribution of the work over the course of a year? Yeah, I think on every job we try to take a look at that um, because there are a limited number of jobs, and with 125 for, or I'm sorry, 111 firms, well, it's a lot of firms. It's a, a lot, lot of firms, firms, big firms. I mean, it it's it is a little it is um, because of the state law, it is seems somewhat counterintuitive to me because it's different from the way we procure construction, completely different. But it's the way the law is set up, and so we have to work within that. And again, we just try to be as fair and as inclusive as possible, and that goes to Mike's previous comments on trying to review annually and bring more people into the the pre-qualified pre pool who want an opportunity to work with us. And we can, I think we have in the past, do a annual or semi-annual report to the capital committee on where the money's going. And I'd be happy to offer that again. That would be helpful. My, if, if um, Do we get economies from those? I'm sure there are probably some firms that we use more than others. Um, no? I shouldn't be so quick to say no, but not, not as much as you would like to see. Not in the design and engineering business. Really? No. Because it seems like if they've been doing work with us, right. and, you know, we, we should start to generate some economies as a result of that. I agree. Yeah. I, the industry, our best leverage on the industry right now is the economy. And that, and that has provided good leverage. But um, it's not, the way contracts in design and engineering are being done now by the Park District and other committees, agencies in the state of Illinois, like Rob said, it's a bit counterintuitive to every other contract we do. But we are following the law. I know there's this new law that you've referred to, but ideally, since all of these firms qualify and, on, and are, are approved, right. wouldn't it? Couldn't they be broken down into specific areas of need and then have them bid on it and get the lowest bidder? I mean, Unfortunately, we can't submit a, an RFP to more than one firm at one time under the pre-qualified pool per the, the processes we have to follow. Rafi could comment on this, but again, we have so asked for proposals and many times rejected the first proposal just because the price is too high. We look at the number of hours, number of people, duration, and you know, people on our staff, including myself, have worked in private architecture offices. We know generally what it takes to do a job, right? know how to schedule staff. Um, so it becomes obvious and when, when we ask for proposals we see those breakdowns and we can we can talk to people. Some people are asking for a, a premium that we just won't accept. We go to the next firm and they'll actually do a job for what you asked them to do it for based upon you know the input. So it, it is helpful to be able to move through. It's just odd not to be able to send out proposals all at one time. I don't know if Rafi wanted to add. Rafi Sirajan, Director of uh, Purchasing, good morning. Uh, one, one thing to also add here, the way the, our, our pool is set up, the um, think of an umbrella, that's design and engineering services, and underneath that umbrella then we have different categories, and firms were asked to identify us in which categories would they like to submit their qualifications for. So we have, for instance, playground design, renovation, uh, new construction. We have, we have a number of different categories. Firms picked which categories they wanted to submit their qualifications for, so then we qualified firms by category. So when Rob and his staff need need to re need services in a particular category or categories, they'll come to purchasing. They'll work with us, and we'll help. We'll you know help them you know get the work they need in that particular category. So in other words, we're not reaching out to all 111 firms for one job uh, when we when we have a need. 
I understand that, but those specific ones that you referred to them, there are a number of them in that group that you're correct. Saying. Correct. And they'll just select the one they feel is best out of correct. Group. Correct. Pursuant to state law. Okay. For the questions, a motion. So moved. Second. A motion carried. The matter is adopted. I'm sorry. If there's no objection, we'll apply the last favor for we'll call vote for the prior matter to this matter. Motion carried and the matter is adopted. Commissioner. Item number three from the Director of Planning, Construction, and Facilities authorization to issue final payment for work completed in connection with Sheridan Park Artificial Turf. Rob. Thank you. Uh, this is to certify that Albright Construction Company on June 7th, 2011, completed in a satisfactory manner and in full compliance with the terms and conditions of the contract. All work in connection with Sheridan Park Artificial Turf. The inspector approving final payment is Stephan Schoenauer. It's therefore recommended that an order be approved for final payment in favor of Albright Construction in the amount of $124,720.76. The original contract amount was $1,015,000. There were no change orders and deducting an unused contingency in the amount of $59,324.85 the final contract amount came to $955,675.15. The M and W B participation were 27% and 5%. Um, this is a, a map of where Sheridan Park is, 19.56 acre park. That seems wrong. Um, in the central region in the 25th ward near west side. This is the site before, and you can see, um, again, there's a lot of exposed dirt, even on a good day. This is during a dry spell prior to park construction. And here's some photos. It's a little dark. Here's some photos after of the new turf. Um, the work included demolition of the existing ball fields and construction of an artificial turf field with two baseball fields, flag football field striping, baseball bases, warm-up mats, concrete paving and curved, curbs, ornamental fencing, standard baseball field fencing including player bench area and batting cages, and batting area, sorry, utility improvements including a new drinking fountain, new sports lighting, stormwater management measures, landscape improvements including lawn, and tree, uh, lawn work and tree pruning, and site furniture including uh, bleachers and mis miscellaneous work as identified in the drawings. Final payment was being withheld pending completion of all warranty items, which have been addressed. The contractors completed and provided approved M and WBE utilization reports. I can take any questions. Do you have any major punch list problems, drainage, any big things that you had to get them to do? I think there were a few uneven spots in the final um, uh, grading that were corrected prior to the, the sewing up of the, the full field, but no, this was a pretty well done job. I think we're we're happy with it. I, I've visited this. It's a fabulous facility. And then, interesting, we had a conversation with the uh, with the park supervisor, and uh, who said that if in their baseball schedule, zero rainouts unless you happen to have wow. the storm at the time of the game. Yeah, it's a it's a great. I've been out there as well too, just watching my nephews play uh, flag football. It's it's pretty cool. It's a good park. Not only are there no change orders, but it also came under the original contract price that was agreed. Yeah, uh, a sign of a, a good set of drawings and a decent contractor. All price been doing pretty good work for us lately. How does that work with the baseball and the soccer from a scheduling standpoint? There's a hmm. That's sort of out, outside my purview, but um, I think there's some in, there's some intensive you know like coordination Closely. that has to occur. <laughs> Closely coordinated. <laughs> yeah. Commissioners, we do have a speaker on this matter, Mr. George Blakemore. Good morning to the commissioners and to the staff and to any concerned citizens. If I were to ask a question, how many citizens were present this morning? Could you raise your hand? I would question it wouldn't be very many. So I feel privileged to be here to 
represent the citizens of the city of Chicago. I also feel that once a person comes up and speaks, all courtesy and kindness and appreciation should be given by staff and the board. And if it is a time limit, all people who speak should abide by this time limit. No big eyes and little eyes. No big a little. We all are in this together as citizens. So no one, if anyone extend the time, all should be questioned several times to be seated. I hope that I'm not being focused. The issue is artificial turf is artificial. It's not the real thing. It's not grass. The state of New York and New Jersey, and someone also said Connecticut, have a more, uh, 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 mer uh, they have outlawed the term that I want to use. They are no longer putting artificial turf in their parks because of uh, environment study states that there hasn't. Now, you know that we are on a green thing here in Chicago. Everybody open space, organic, natural. Now it's nothing like natural turf and the natural turf is the grass. So the negative impact, I've challenged the park district to make a study on the negative impact of artificial turf on the health of these people who are using these these rubber mats. Mr. Blake, so Mr. Blakemore will be seated. He's not here permanent. He will be seated. So please, again, have a moratorium on these artificial turfs in our parks. You have this. Let this be the last one that this issue will never come up again because it is an environmental hazard. And again, I will be seated. Again, I stress that you must treat all people with dignity and respect. If you are Mr. So-and-so on this board, you come up and speak. If you're a community activist, you speak. If you're a concerned citizen, you speak. And you get the same allotted time and the same respect that all citizens are deserved. Thank you again. And you have a peaceful and blessed day. And perhaps at 4 o'clock when I come back as a public servant, more public citizens will be involved in this afternoon session. May God bless all of you. Thank you, Mr. Blakemore. And uh, may you have a good day as well. Just for the record, um, uh, I, th I think we did extend the time for Mr. Blakemore. Yes, we did. More than two minutes? Yes, we did. Okay. Um, I'd also like to request, I mean, obviously the Park District is, uh, is very concerned in making sure that everything we do is, is uh, beneficial and healthy. And we have an extensive um, file of all the latest studies on artificial turf, independent studies done by states, done by universities. And uh, if Mr. Blakemore hasn't been given that file, I'd very much appreciate uh, if he would, so York, that he's up to date on the facts. New York have, have, have a no more. Thank you. But aren't we, uh, nothing is what it was before. So artificial turf, like everything else, has evolved from where it started. And I think that the artificial turf that is being installed now is a very different artificial turf than the artificial turf that was thought to have caused problems in other places. Are we not? Yeah, and it's you know certainly probably beyond the scope of this committee meeting to get deep, deep into this, but um, the independent studies that are done, when they look at, you know, they sample air quality in site, um, the only problem that they, that's found consistently with the artificial turf that we're using is a heat issue. 
It is on a hot summer day. It's hotter than natural. Time. Yeah. And and that is that is the issue, is is the heat. But but you know there's there are a lot of studies. Some of them do show some conflict and. Um, but but the consensus issue is yeah on hot days it's a problem. Commissioner, if you, if I can have Brendan Daly at your convenience brief you if you want further information on um, those studies. I'm satisfied. Thank you. Any further questions? Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. No objection. We'll apply the last bit of the roll call vote from the prior matter to this matter. Motion carried and the matter is adopted. That concludes the committee on capital improvements. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those against? Motion carried. The committee on capital improvements is now adjourned. On this day, Wednesday, January 11th, uh, 2012, at uh, 11.40 a.m., a meeting of the Committee of the Whole is being held in the 8th floor boardroom of the Administration Building located at 541 North Fairbanks. Will the Secretary please take a roll call? Commissioner Shalaby? Here. Commissioner Coldike? Commissioner Hanlon? Here. Commissioner Lavelle? Here. Commissioner Salgado? Here. President Traubert? Here. The quorum is present. Let the record reflect that General Superintendent Michael Kelly and General Counsel Maria Garcia are also in attendance. At this time, the Committee of the Whole will consider various uh, matters which are pursuant to the Illinois Open Meetings Act appropriately discussed in executive session. There will be a review of executive session minutes. So moved. Second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. The meeting is now in executive session. So moved. Second. 
All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Return to open session. Uh, the Committee of the Whole met this morning to review executive session minutes as is required by the Code of the Chicago Park District, Chapter 2, Section A, Subsection 16F. The Committee hereby submits this report and recommends that it be adopted. The Board of Commissioners, per the Code of the Chicago Park District, Chapter 2, Section A, Subsection 16D, approve the destruction of verbatim records for May 13th, 2009. Is there a motion to approve the matter? I'll move. Second. Will Secretary take a roll call for the adoption of the matter? Commissioner Shallaby? Aye. Commissioner Hanlon? Aye. Commissioner Lavelle? Aye. Commissioner Salgado? Aye. President Traubert? Aye. Motion carried and the matter is adopted. The Board of Commissioners, per the code of the Chicago Park District, Chapter 2, Section A, Subsection 16F2, approved the release of the following executive session minutes for public inspection June 8, 2011. July 11th, 2011, October 12th, 2011. So moved. Second. If no objection, we'll apply the last favorable roll call vote from the prior matter to this matter. Motion carried and the matter is adopted. That concludes the Committee of the Whole. Is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. The Committee of the Whole is now adjourned.